In a post-World War II culture, there are few movie monsters that are as recognizable as that of Godzilla. While his design and lore may change through different adaptations, he still remains as recognizable as ever. Not only does he stand out because of the cool and terrifying concept of a giant lizard monster coming from the depths to terrorize humanity, but also since his creation he has always been an allegory for our own struggles. He is a reminder that no matter how powerful the human race may seem, we are often powerless in the face of these vast forces of nature around us. And I personally really love Godzilla, whether he is a man in a suit, whether he is CGI, or whether he is animated. And today I'm going to talk about every iteration of Godzilla through the decades, as well as the world around the creators that inspired their take on the Titan. And to make this video a little more silly and goofy, I'm going to rank them in a tier list. Because those aren't divisive at all. <laughs> the categories are very standard. We got A through F tier with S being supreme above all the others. And to be clear, this ranking is totally just my personal opinion. How the character in these different iterations resonated with me and how well I think the message of the creators was conveyed. If you disagree with my rankings, that is completely fine. This is not a definitive work. I don't have a whiteboard at home, so I'm adding the tier list in post. In fact, feel free to leave your own rankings or debate my choices down in the comments below. I only ask that you be respectful when you do so. We're all friends here, and this is just a lighthearted video on one of my favorite monster characters of all time. So with all that said, thank you so much for watching, and let's get into it. The first instance of the character comes in 1954 with a movie that is simply titled Gojira. Of course, the American translation of this movie would call him Godzilla. This was directed by Ishiro Honda under the Toho Company. And as many fans of the Godzilla franchise know, this initial movie was made as an allegory for the devastation faced by Japan following the dropping of the two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. However, there is also a third lesser known event that also inspired the film. You see, in 1954, a fishing boat set out from Japan to go fishing in a nearby atoll. None of the men in the crew realized that this atoll was being used by the United States to test nuclear weapons. And while the men on this boat were fishing, they were unwittingly exposed to the fallout of the Castle Bravo nuclear test. This was the largest nuclear bomb that the United States ever detonated. The boat was showered with radioactive ash that left lifelong burns on each of the crew members. And one of this crew member did die as a result of these injuries. Japan was understandably very anti-nuclear in the wake of these incidents, and Godzilla was born out of that. The message was twofold. For the Japanese public, it was a reminder of the devastation and the horrors that they had faced as a country. And for American audiences whose knowledge of the nuclear fallout was heavily censored by the American government, it served as a horrible window into what Japan was going through at this time. And in this film, Godzilla takes on many of the characteristics of the atomic bomb. He causes the same level of destruction that the bombs did, bringing entire cities to the ground and covering the earth in rubble and fire. And in certain shots of the movie, his head is shaped like a mushroom cloud rising up in the background, much like the mushroom clouds of the atomic bombs. He leaves high levels of radiation wherever he goes. And this radiation also affects the tuna supply in Japan, just as the Bikini Atoll tests caused a massive food shortage in Japan. This Godzilla movie was the first to utilize a technique called suitmation. The original plan was to make a stop motion monster in the same way that they had made the King Kong movie prior, but instead they went with a human piloting a Godzilla suit and destroying a town of miniatures. This is what suitmation is, and it would be the primary technique used for decades to come in Godzilla media. And now briefly for the lore of this version of Godzilla. Godzilla comes from a species of ancient underwater creatures that evolved into the form that we see in the movie. 
and underwater testing of hydrogen bombs forces Godzilla into shallower waters, where he begins devouring all of the fish that Japan relies on for food. This version of the character is 50 meters tall, or 164 feet if you speak wrong. This Godzilla possesses atomic breath, which is essentially an insanely radioactive fire breath. He is immune to all attempts at attacking him with guns, missiles, or electricity. And he is ultimately defeated with a fictional weapon in the film called an Oxygen Destroyer, which burns all of the oxygen in its radius. It is blasted at Godzilla, who essentially suffocates to death in the wake of this explosion. Although future iterations of the character going off of this original film will debate back and forth on whether this Oxygen Destroyer actually killed him or not. This was the first ever Godzilla design and was responsible for making the character a global phenomena. Not only that, but it exposed the whole world to the horrors that Japan had faced at the end of World War II. And for these reasons, the original film Gojira and its version of the character goes in S tier. Sure, the film is dated in its effects, but even so, it still works insanely well. It is also very effective in its story and in its message. And this Godzilla also set the bar for all different versions of the character going forward. A tall, monstrous lizard from the depths who destroys entire cities. This was a powerful first entry for the character, and it deserves this S tier. OG Godzilla is iconic, and it set the bar for all versions of the character going forward, so this was a pretty easy decision. But now, moving on. This next version of the character was also made by Toho, but I'm creating a separate category for it because of the massive tonal change that this next series of films takes on. While the first was unquestionably a monster disaster film, these subsequent films are more focused on building Toho's monsterverse, essentially. Many fans of Godzilla will lump the original Godzilla and this next series of films into what is called the Showa period, or the era of Godzilla films that were made during the reign of Emperor Showa. And while there is still a lot of destruction brought on by Godzilla, it is more of a monster film and less a somber reflection of the atomic age. And there are several entries in this franchise lumped under the Showa period. Godzilla Raids Again in 1955 features Godzilla's ancient foe, Anguirus. This was directed by Motoyoshi Oda. King Kong vs. Godzilla in 1962 was his first full-color appearance alongside the equally popular monster, King Kong. This and three subsequent entries were all directed by the creator of the original film, Ishiro Honda. And in 1964 came two separate Godzilla films, Mothra vs. Godzilla and Ghidorah, the three-headed monster. I'll leave it up to your imagination who he fights in these movies. <laughs> Additionally, Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster also introduced the character of Rodan into the franchise. Rodan initially appeared in his own film in 1956, but in Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster he becomes officially canon to this Toho Monsterverse. And in 1965 there came Invasion of the Astro Monster, which is just Ghidorah. <laughs> this movie also has aliens in it, for some reason. And in 1966 and 1967, director Jun Fukuda directed two different Godzilla movies. These were Ibira, Horror of the Deep, and Son of Godzilla. Son of Godzilla introduces a baby version of the character that hatches from an egg. So... Now there's two of them, I guess. His name is Manila, by the way. Ishiro Honda comes back to direct Destroy All Monsters and All Monsters Attack in the years 1968 and 1969. The first of these films takes place in 1999, a future where humanity has achieved world peace and all of the monsters live isolated on one island, creatively called Monster Island. But then aliens come down and start like mind controlling all the monsters to like destroy cities. And when the monsters all become free from this mind control, the aliens then send in Ghidorah to kill them all, I guess. It seems in this universe, Ghidorah itself is an alien, whereas all the other monsters seem to be from Earth. And all monsters attack is... 
interesting. The whole story is about this kid, Ichiro Miki, who is like constantly bullied by people around him. And he dreams about being on Monster Island and he sees uh, Manila, Godzilla's child, also being bullied by the monsters there. And so the whole movie is about him having these dreams about Manila overcoming his bullies and using that to just overcome his own bullies. It's not a bad message, but what? <laughs> Godzilla is in the movie too, but a lot of footage of him is just recycled from past movies. While the director says that this is his favorite entry in the Godzilla franchise, Godzilla critics and fans basically all agree that this was the worst one. <laughs> Godzilla movies continued to be made every single year in Japan from the year 1971 to 1975. And in these, he fights Hedorah, Gigan, 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 Gigan? Megalon, and Mechagodzilla. Now, I could talk about these in more detail, but much like Godzilla fans at the time, I'm kind of tired of talking about this version of Godzilla. Godzilla's design does vary between these movies slightly, but overall it keeps that same man in the lizard suit look. And to me, this stretch of films feels a lot like the Fast and the Furious movies. Uh, stay with me, please. They used to be about street racing and finding family among friends, and then it became about going to space and performing superhuman feats of strength and people dying and coming back. The original Godzilla was about the fear and the suffering of the atomic age, but as the movies went along, it became so much more ridiculous that it became unrecognizable from where it started. And one of the later movies, Godzilla vs. Megalon, gave us the most iconic bad Godzilla clip. Roll it. They started out fine and they introduced very iconic characters like Ghidorah, Mothra, Mechagodzilla. However, where they went is just so ridiculous. While future iterations of Godzilla would introduce very out there bizarre concepts that I do find interesting and that I think work, this version of the character is not one of them. And for that, I'm putting this Godzilla at D tier. The design remains iconic, and I have no issue with watching a man in the suit fight other people in suits and destroy miniatures. To be honest, that and the fact that the movies towards the beginning weren't as ridiculous are the only reason that this version isn't F tier. This Godzilla started out so good, but for what it became, I have to put it lower. They also lost sight, I think, of what Godzilla originally stood for in the attempt to not capitalize, but to ride the wave, the phenomena that was Godzilla. He was an outlet to vent frustration and anguish for elements of the world that are beyond our control. Initially, that was the atomic bomb, and in future versions, it will be other disasters. But these movies lost sight of that, in my opinion. And it seems that culture at the time was also very burnt out with how Godzilla was at the time, because for the next 10 years, no Godzilla movies would be made. However, in 1978, we would get our first Western take of the character on TV screens across America. In 1978, the American animation studio Hanna-Barbera, with the permission of Toho Company, began a two-season series on the character Godzilla. This is the same studio that made the original Scooby-Doo series, and the two feel very similar in terms of characterization and art style. In this series, Godzilla is a hero who fights other monsters in order to save humanity. He basically looks like a large dinosaur with green skins and dark green scales running down his back. He breathes fire and also has laser eyes, um, so there's that. And according to the theme song, this version of the character is 30 stories tall. This is about 99 meters or 325 feet. This would make him the tallest version of the character so far. 
I will say though, because of the quality of the animation, there is very little regard to size continuity in this series. Sometimes Godzilla can hold an entire ship in his hand, and other times he can only hold like two or three people in his hand. It really just depends on who was drawing him at the time. He is voiced by Ted Cassidy, who basically just does a bunch of roaring sounds, and that's it. And he specifically comes to the aid of the main humans in this series. This series follows the escapades of the crew of a scientific vessel called the Calico. They journey around the world encountering massive kaiju as they go. There is the cautious but wise Captain Carl Majors, who also has this like weird futuristic pager thing that like summons Godzilla for some reason. <laughs> It's never explained, don't worry. There is the bold scientist, Dr. Quinn Darian, the witty Brock Borden, the son of Dr. Darian Pete, who acts as the babysitter for this crew's Scooby-Doo equivalent. And that equivalent is a character by the name of Godzuki, who is Godzilla's nephew. The series consisted of one-off episodes of the crew just like going around encountering some massive kaiju or massive threat, summoning Godzilla to take out this threat, saying some very old-fashioned, like, humorous idioms, and then sailing off into the sunset. A lot of the animation in this show is recycled, and it is extremely cheesy, but like all cartoons were at the time. It is made for children, so I can't really fault it for that. And I have to admit that this is a series that I am very nostalgic for. And not nostalgic because I was around when this show was running. I'm nostalgic for it in a much more Gen Z way. <laughs> See, when my family first got Netflix 12 years ago, back when it was one of the pioneers of streaming services, one of the shows that I really loved to watch back in those days was Godzilla. Godzilla's design overall in this show is pretty boring, but some of the designs of the creatures that he faced were very interesting and very unique. It's also kind of its own thing. Other than the character being named Godzilla, it has no ties or connection to anything that came before. In Godzilla's appearances in Japanese media, he kind of goes back and forth between this terrifying force of destruction and being this kind of noble spirit of nature and savior of humanity. But in American media, except for one version that we'll talk about later, Godzilla has always been seen as a hero character. And for my nostalgia, as well as this series' unique take on Godzilla, I'm gonna give it a B tier. I know objectively that it's very cheesy and quite obviously made for kids. That's why it's not A tier for me. I do think that it's a creative take on Godzilla, even if it is just Scooby-Doo with giant monsters. And then, five years after this series finished, Japan decided that it was time to revisit Godzilla, beginning with the aptly named Return of Godzilla. During the Heisei era of Japan, this 1984 movie by Toho would serve as a direct sequel to the original film from 1954. This was a hard reboot of the Godzilla franchise, eliminating all of the movies that came after the original. This was directed by Toji Hashimoto, and this time they endeavored to keep the serious tone of the character that the original movie had. Godzilla is back to his roots of destroying civilization and gaining energy from the nuclear plants all around Japan. It also destroys a Soviet submarine, nearly igniting a nuclear war between the Americans and the Soviets. Japan is forced to devise strategies and devices capable of taking out Godzilla as all of their weaponry is ineffective. Eventually, he is lured to the mouth of a volcano where the characters of the film set off a controlled eruption that traps Godzilla in the heart of this volcano. This is more of a return to the Godzilla that audiences loved. Plus, there is the Cold War undertone of the tension between the Russians and the Americans only making things worse for the countries around them. And in the movie, the Japanese government's censorship of the return of Godzilla causes even more problems. Godzilla was once more a vehicle to talk about all of the problems in the world, specifically the fears of nuclear war in the midst of this Cold War. 
and his redesign for the movie is amazing too. It's similar to the traditional suit but with larger eyes and a more expressive mouth, which lends itself to the many close-ups of Godzilla in this movie. His canonical height was also increased from 50 meters to 80 meters so that he wouldn't seem small against the newly developed skyscrapers in Japan's cityscape. Specifically Tokyo, he's always trashing Tokyo. This is the version of Godzilla that we also see in subsequent films in the Heisei period. I hope I'm saying that right. I hope I'm saying all of these right. I also want to acknowledge before continuing that the actor who portrayed Godzilla in this period of movies, Kenpachiro Setsuma, has just passed away as of last week. And so my heart goes out to his family and to everyone who knew him. He was responsible for bringing a beloved character to life. And he pushed his mind and his body to extremes to do so. And that effort will never be forgotten. Now moving on to the remaining Godzilla films during the Heisei period. Beginning with 1989's Godzilla vs. Biolante? Biolante? Bio... Bi... I... This thing... <laughs> This is a man-made abomination created by a grieving scientist through a combination of Godzilla's DNA, the DNA of plant life, and his own dead daughter. So, um, what? Even though this is crazy, there is still the overarching theme of man trying to play God with forces beyond our comprehension and being punished for it. 1991's Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah introduces time travelers from the future, which, uh... Oh boy. They try and prevent Godzilla from mutating in the first place, but, uh, spoiler alert, the time travelers are evil, and they summon Ghidorah to, to kill Godzilla. Woo! And so the main characters make Godzilla even more powerful to try and stop Ghidorah. And so, Godzilla wins, and then destroys the entire city of Tokyo and also Sapporo as well. <laughs> so <laughs> that really worked out. <sighs> 1992's Godzilla vs. Mothra was made much more family friendly, much like the movies that we were talking about in the Showa period before the reboot. And in 1993, this was the highest grossing movie in the country of Japan. The number one spot went to Jurassic Park. <laughs> I don't know why this is crazy to me, but it is. This has Godzilla fighting Mothra and a reincarnation of Batra. This is an ancient and fearsome moth kaiju. There's also these weird humanoid people in the film who might be aliens who worship Batra, I guess. And in the end, Godzilla is sealed underwater and Mothra leaves Earth. So I guess she was an alien too. I don't know. Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2 and Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla are also entries in this franchise. <laughs> we are now seeing a repetition of the plots of these movies getting more and more grandiose and more and more ridiculous. I definitely get the decision to market Godzilla to the whole family, including children, but there's something about the original Godzilla film, as well as the first in this reboot series, Return of Godzilla, about him being this terrifying destructive force that just, it hits different, man. And then in 1995, Godzilla vs. Destor Destoroya? Destroya? Dest that one's released. This is the last movie in the Heisei continuity. And the final film is notable because once again Godzilla is the threat. It appears that his nuclear reactor of a heart is becoming unstable for some reason. He destroys much of Hong Kong and could potentially destroy the world if his heart goes critical. There is interesting themes in this movie like grief and pain. This is the film that was billed as the final entry in the Godzilla franchise. And this really did make a good finale in this reboot saga. Heisei Godzilla certainly has great moments. It endeavored to be more serious than what the Showa era Godzilla became. And while they only partially succeeded, they did better than back then. They also made cool design choices in this era, making Godzilla look more reptilian and more fierce looking. I'm going to be putting this at C tier because I do think it is better than the Showa continuity. And I'd put it slightly below the 1978 show. 
They do such different things, and yet they somehow feel similar to me. I think it's a vibe thing. Where they differ for me is their execution. And again, they started out very strong with the return of Godzilla, but then from there it devolved into the same Godzilla versus blank formula with more and more ridiculous stuff being added like aliens and time travel and all this stuff. And this is also not to discredit Satsuma's performance at all. He brought an energy and a spirit to the character that people still love to this day. This period loses points for how outrageous the stories got, not for how dedicated the performers were. And now it's time to go back to America, because yes, we do have to talk about that Godzilla. In 1998, TriStar Pictures and director Roland Emmerich released their own film titled Godzilla. Throughout the 90s and the 2000s, Roland Emmerich was considered the master of the disaster film, with movies such as Independence Day, The Day After Tomorrow, and 2012, he has a very impressive catalog of disaster movies. And as every Godzilla fan knows, uh, boy did he try and make a Godzilla movie. <laughs> this movie takes place in New York City, and they change many of the aspects of Godzilla's lore for this movie. Godzilla was first an iguana that was mutated by nuclear tests in French Polynesia, and his physical appearance is dramatically different from any Godzilla we have seen before or since. This version of the character is 70 meters or 230 feet tall. This was also the first time that CGI was used to bring the creature of Godzilla to life, although some shots in the film are shot by a man in a Godzilla suit. And there is a scene where it looks like he may have fire breath, but that is like never shown throughout the rest of the movie, so like maybe. And it starts out good enough. Godzilla is rampaging through the city, destroying everything in its path, while the military desperately tries to take it down. It has all the hallmarks of a traditional and a classic Godzilla movie. And then it just becomes Jurassic Park. Like it just, it hard pivots into verbatim the plot of Jurassic Park. Godzilla lays eggs, the eggs start hatching, and the offspring are these hyper-intelligent small reptiles that chase our protagonists through narrow corridors. Um, is that sounding familiar? <laughs> Eventually the nest is destroyed and Godzilla is killed, ending the movie. Now this version of the character was, um, not received well. <laughs> Emmerich got bashed pretty hard by fans who said he didn't understand Godzilla at all, which yeah, they're right. It was a box office failure, and so future plans for sequels of this movie were scrapped in favor of an animated spin-off TV series. Although I'm just going to lump this whole thing together as one Godzilla event. While the movie and its spin-off series are both under the trademark Godzilla, the movie was so bad that Toho Company filed a trademark in 2006 stipulating that all future adaptations of this character that may be made have to be made under the name Zilla. This was a reference to cheap off-brand knockoff merchandise of Godzilla being sold under the name Zilla. In this move, Toho is kind of embracing the 1998 version's Godzilla from Wish reputation. But that said, he is still on this list, so I still have to rank him. And I will be completely honest, I do have a lot of nostalgia for this version of Godzilla. I really enjoyed it as a kid back when I was young and didn't really understand Godzilla and the extensive lore behind it. And as its own standalone thing, it is a decent monster movie, even though it does hard pivot into just the plot of Jurassic Park. However, this is a Godzilla ranking, and this is barely a Godzilla. And I do also respect the choice to try a different design. This is not a bad design. It looks good, but in addition to changing Godzilla's appearance, they also changed everything else to the point where it's not recognizable as Godzilla. 
It's like the ship of Theseus. If you replace every part of the ship, is it still the same ship? And in this case, the answer is simply no. For those reasons, this is a C-tier Godzilla. It would be lower, but like I said, I do have a lot of nostalgia towards this film, and I do respect the bravery to change Godzilla's design this drastically. I think that the direction this movie took was overall negative, but we will see future adaptations of Godzilla that take a drastically different direction that I think are very cool. But now we move back to Japan because we are now entering Godzilla's millennia period. In 1999, Japan revived their own Godzilla franchise with the film Godzilla 2000. And while they did model their new suit after the Godzilla suit from King Kong vs. Godzilla, there is nothing to indicate that this film was connected to any entry of the franchise from previous. They also scaled Godzilla down to 52 meters or roughly 170 feet. And man, the silhouette of Godzilla from this poster goes so hard. <laughs> this movie was met with mixed reviews, and future installments will ignore this movie altogether, so I'm going to consider Godzilla 2000 its own Godzilla. I'm gonna give it a C tier because my exact thoughts on this version of the character could be summed up with meh. The design goes hard, but the movie goes so medium. This movie is like when Popeyes had the limited time ghost pepper chicken sandwich. I was excited to try it out because I love spicy food, but when I had it, it was even less spicy than just the normal spicy chicken sandwich. This film doesn't do anything egregious to earn a low ranking, but it also doesn't do anything impressive. So see it is. We now come to the year 2000 with the movie Godzilla vs. Megaguirus. This film did use the same suit as that of Godzilla 2000, but it ignores that movie entirely and is kind of a soft reboot of the franchise, ignoring everything except for the original film. And this is the classic Godzilla versus new sci-fi kaiju of the year. A formula that has been used for half a century at this point. There's a bit of an anti-nuclear stance in the movie. People found out that Godzilla feeds on nuclear energy, so nuclear energy is banned in this world. So it has that going for it, kind of. This film does nothing new and adds nothing to the overall Godzilla mythos other than introducing just a new character. And so for this, I'm gonna give the first F tier. I've been pretty nice so far giving points for things that I think stand out in these movies, but nothing stands out about this movie. We now come to the very wordy title, Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah, Giant Monsters All Out Attack. Woo! I really just said that. And in contrast to the last movie, this one from 2001 is very interesting. In this standalone movie, Godzilla is the threat of the movie, making Mothra and King Ghidorah protagonists in this story. And in a rather on-the-nose but still very powerful metaphor, Godzilla is the bad guy because he is currently possessed by the spirits of all the lives lost during the Pacific War. This was the largest theater of combat in all of World War II. They were enraged by the current Japanese government's denial of the atrocities that they committed during this time, and so they send Godzilla to attack Japan as retribution for that ignorance. It reframes Godzilla not only as a force of nature, but also a primal spirit of vengeance. And in contrast, Mothra and Ghidorah are the protagonists that are protecting Japan from Godzilla. This is, I believe, the first time that Ghidorah has actually been a moral good in these movies. Speaking of which, this movie is very compelling because of its moral ambiguity. While Godzilla destroying Japan is a bad thing, he serves as a reminder to the Japanese government of the evils that they themselves committed. And in Mothra and Ghidorah fighting Godzilla, they are saving lives, which is a good thing, but they are also silencing the voices of those who died in such an unjust way. 
they are silencing the voices that bring valid criticism against Japan itself. Godzilla is ultimately defeated, but the characters of the movie as well as the Japanese audience watching this movie are forced to confront Japan's own dark history. This is once again a return to Godzilla's original purpose as a reminder of the horrors that we would rather forget or distract ourselves from. And for that, this incarnation of Godzilla gets an S tier for me. This is the first time since his inception that Godzilla has been utilized so effectively. It is a kaiju fight movie, but the film also calls out the faults in the Japanese government at the time. It uses Godzilla to impart an important message to the audience. This is great, and this movie is widely considered one of the best Godzilla films, which I would have to agree with. And in 2002, we get Godzilla against Mechagodzilla. Much like all of the Godzilla movies in the millennium era, this film ignores all previous lore of Godzilla except for the original movie. So whenever I'm talking about a Godzilla movie in the millennium era, unless I specifically say otherwise, just assume that this movie ignores all other Godzilla movies except for the original and is a continuation of that story. This is a fun clash between Godzilla and a human character piloting one of Godzilla's most iconic villains or opponents, Mecha Godzilla, or Kiryu as he's called in this movie. And unlike other entries in the Godzilla franchise, this movie is primarily focused on the journey of its human protagonist. This is the character of Lieutenant Akane Yashiro, who is played by Japanese actress and model Yumiko Shaku. It is a very human story about guilt and the need to prove oneself. And in 2003 came the movie Godzilla Tokyo SOS. This was a direct sequel to Godzilla against Mechagodzilla. It picks up after the events of this movie, but with a new protagonist. You see, the final fight between Godzilla and Mechagodzilla left both quite damaged. And so one year later, repairs on Mechagodzilla or Kiryu are nearly complete. And I should probably mention this, but in the first movie it's established that the frame of Mechagodzilla in these two movies was made using the bones of the original Godzilla, the Godzilla that was killed by the Oxygen Destroyer in 1954. Mothra somehow advises Japan that Godzilla knows this and will not stop attacking Japan until the bones of his predecessor are returned where they belong to the ocean. They decide that this is the proper course of action, but they will only do so once Kiryu successfully takes out Godzilla to ensure that he can never return again. There are some great fights, and it all ends with Mechagodzilla taking Godzilla away from Japan and back into the depths of the ocean, and in doing so, returning the bones of the original Godzilla to their proper resting place. This is a great two-part story with some great themes and conflict. For this, I'm going to give this version of Godzilla a solid B. It would be an A, but this is a Godzilla tier list, and the focus of these movies isn't really on Godzilla. There's nothing wrong with that, and it is an interesting story, but when the title of this video has Godzilla in the name, that is a deciding factor in this list. And in 2004, we get the final entry in Godzilla's Millennium Era. And that is Godzilla Final Wars. And this film is, uh, oh boy. <laughs> it's filled with monsters and superhumans somehow, and aliens for some reason. It's, it's a lot. Once again, Godzilla is seen as a hero as humanity reawakens him to deal with all of that. I'm sure it's a fun monster movie, but coming off the coattails of these last two entries with a fantastic story told between the two of them, this feels like a very lackluster outro to the millennium era. And for that, I'm putting this version of Godzilla in C tier. It sure is one of the Godzilla movies of all time. We are now moving on to the Godzilla movies made from the 2010s and onwards. In 2014, director Gareth Edwards and Legendary Pictures released their own kaiju film by the simple title, Godzilla. 
This was the first film in the American MonsterVerse. And unlike the 1998 version, this adaptation is far more respectful of the character and its origins, despite still putting their own spin on the lore. In this carnation, Godzilla is an apex predator who has existed for eons. He fed on radiation, and when the Earth began to settle more into a form that is recognizable today, he went deep, deep underwater to absorb radiation from the core of the planet. Being a creature that feeds on radiation, he does have his signature atomic breath, and when he is overcharged, he can also unleash atomic blasts. He is 106 meters or roughly 350 feet tall. This would make him the tallest version of the character so far. And when the nuclear age began in 1954, Godzilla resurfaced again. While his existence was heavily classified by world governments, they all lived in perpetual fear of what this creature was capable of. And so, the same year that the original Godzilla movie came out, even though that's probably not canon to this universe, they lured Godzilla to the Bikini Atoll where they detonated a nuclear bomb in the hopes that this would kill Godzilla. And Monarch was created as an international organization dedicated to studying Godzilla and other kaiju that they come across. And design-wise, this version of the character is much closer to the original 1954 version, but they still put their own twist on it. Being a fully CGI creature and not being limited to the physics of a man in a suit, he takes on a much more reptilian appearance. True to his lore, he is much more dinosaur-like, with the appearance of being far older than the dinosaurs. And of course, this was the first installment in Legendary's MonsterVerse, in which they introduced kaiju from the Japanese universe such as Mothra, Ghidorah, and Rodan, and they even give their own take on the relationships between these characters. Mothra and Godzilla in this version seem to have a symbiotic relationship with each other, and Ghidorah is both an extraterrestrial and an invasive species in the world ecosystem, who threatens to disrupt the balance of the natural world. And it seems to be an unspoken law with the kaiju in this legendary universe that there is one creature that exists above all as the supposed king. And at the end of the movie Godzilla King of Monsters, this is solidified as being Godzilla. And in later installments, he goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Kong, and it is established that their two species have had a rivalry that has lasted eons. And in the still-yet-to-come continuation of this saga, it seems that the two forces will team up to deal with some new threat. Godzilla's relationship with humanity in this version was kind of up in the air initially, but at this point in the franchise, he is clearly a protector of humanity, despite all the deaths that he's probably caused from collateral damage. And the theme of this franchise is certainly an environmental one. And as such, Godzilla represents the primordial spirit of nature itself, maintaining balance in the global ecosystem. And if something threatens that ecosystem, then he intervenes. And out of fear of the spirit of nature, some company meddles with powers beyond their understanding and comprehension to create Mecha Godzilla. And when humanity does this and threatens the ecosystem's balance again, Godzilla intervenes. And the sound design of Godzilla and all the other creatures in this universe really is incredible. It really does sound like a modern update of the iconic Godzilla sound. I do find that this series writing around the characters often struggles, but this is a Godzilla tier list, and Legendary has a very strong take on Godzilla, in my opinion. And for that reason, I'm giving Legendary Godzilla an A tier. I do really enjoy this version of the character, however, there is something missing that I do think deprives it of Legendary status. Haha, <laughs> Legendary. 
I could have broken up Legendary Godzilla movie by movie, but I thought it best to just go over the whole thing as one Godzilla. And now we hop over to Japan to talk about the Godzilla movies made during the Reiwa era, which goes from 2016 to the present day. Beginning of course with the 2016 movie Shin Godzilla. This was co-directed by Hideki Anno and Shinji Higuchi, both of whom are most known for their work on the anime Neon Genesis Evangelion. This anime is most recognizable for its unique designs and terrifying cosmic entities, and both of these talents would be put to use in their take of Shin Godzilla. I have never seen another version of Godzilla that is both fully in line with the original design and intention of Godzilla, and yet simultaneously so dramatically different. The silhouette is the same, but this is the most terrifying version of the character I have ever seen. This is also the first Japanese Godzilla to be fully CGI, although it still somehow feels like you are watching a man in a suit. It still maintains that kind of physicality of a man in a suit, even though it is CGI. The final form that we see in the movie is roughly 118 meters, or 389 feet. This would make Shin Godzilla the tallest version of Godzilla both before and since its creation. Both the design and the story itself almost liken Shin Godzilla to some kind of horrific, eldritch being. And the word Shin in this context can refer to a few different things. It could mean real, referring to this as the true version of Godzilla. It can mean evolved Godzilla, which if you've seen the movie, you know why that makes sense. It can also mean God, likening Godzilla in this version to some kind of cosmic force now unleashed upon Japan. Now this movie is first and foremost a critique of the Japanese government's slow response to the triple disaster they faced in 2011. Much of the country faced extreme devastation, and it is entirely possible that many casualties could have been avoided with a faster response time, but sadly that is not the reality of what happened. This series of disasters was so totally destructive and completely unstoppable, and so Shin Godzilla was made to be equally destructive and unstoppable. However, the more important aspect of the story is the series of mistakes and failures that the Japanese government makes in its response to Godzilla. And this version of the character is utterly terrifying. It is respectful of the franchise that came before it, but also takes Godzilla into new terrifying and exciting avenues. Now with all other versions of Godzilla, I've gone into more detail on my reasons for why I rate them the way that I do, and I wanted to do that with Shin Godzilla, but after doing research into it and just like really, <laughs> really getting into the weeds of it, I'm going to be intentionally vague about this version of Godzilla because I want to do an entire dedicated video on Shin Godzilla at some point in the near future. So expect that sometime down the road, but for now, let's just get to the rating. In a future video, I will talk more in depth about my reasoning for why I love Shin Godzilla so much, but in my opinion, this is probably the best utilization of the character of Godzilla since the original film. And they take him in a new, surprising, and utterly horrifying direction. And for those reasons, and many more that I'll elaborate on in a future video, I am giving Shin Godzilla an S tier. This movie was very divisive for Western audiences, but for me personally, this is the best Godzilla movie of all time. And this entry would be a great place to end the video, but boy are we not gonna do that. <laughs> because from 2017 to 2018, Toho Animation, in partnership with Netflix, produced a Godzilla anime 
trilogy, beginning with Godzilla, Planet of the Monsters. This is a sci-fi movie taking place 20,000 years after humanity abandoned Earth. You see, they left because the world became infested with these giant kaiju that they couldn't stop. However, Godzilla emerged and arose above them all and defeated them one by one. And once he did that, Godzilla then set his sights on humanity, and humanity was powerless to stop him. Even with the help of a couple alien races and their technology, they were still unable to stop him. And I know I said aliens, and I know that's been a frustration for me in the past, but this is an anime sci-fi trilogy set in 20,000 years in the future, so I'm actually going to allow this one. Seeing that Godzilla was unstoppable for the safety of humanity, they all fled to the stars seeking refuge among other races on other planets. And this movie is about a crew returning to Earth 20,000 years after these events to try and defeat Godzilla and reclaim the planet. They are convinced that they know his weakness, but unfortunately to exploit it would mean to engage in close quarters combat with Godzilla. They succeed in eliminating the monster only to realize it was a younger, much smaller, descendant of Godzilla, and then the real Godzilla arrives. He is much larger and easily demolishes what's left of the team after their already difficult struggle with his younger offspring. The story then continues with the second movie, Godzilla City on the Edge of Battle. This film deals with the crew's response to the events of the first film, as well as introducing a small group of aliens who have been living on Earth for thousands of years in the warehouse that used to house Mecha Godzilla. There's a lot of themes of sacrifice and that the only way to truly defeat Godzilla is to transcend humanity, which is weird, I guess. Not much seems to happen, and the film ends with Godzilla destroying everything. <laughs> and then there's the final film, Godzilla the Planet Eater. In this one, the aliens on Earth show their true nature and the fact that they are trying to summon Ghidorah from another dimension, I guess, to eat Godzilla. And they also revealed that for millennia, they have been sacrificing entire planets to Ghidorah to appease him, I guess. I don't know. The humans stop the aliens and Godzilla beats Ghidorah. Happy ending. And the protagonist of the story allows Godzilla to destroy him, the structures around him, and all surviving members of the crew and of Earth in general because he knows that that is the only way to stomp out any chance of Ghidorah ever returning. And so the trilogy ends exactly where it began with Godzilla just running the earth and humanity being elsewhere. <laughs> this version of the character looks insanely cool and is a great proof of concept that Godzilla would make a fantastic anime. In terms of the story and its human characters, however, this trilogy fell very flat. There wasn't much personality in any of the characters, it kind of just seemed like they were hoping that audiences would just come back for like the cool fight scenes, which I guess they did because they made a whole trilogy. For those reasons, this version of Goods. <laughs> Godzilla. For those reasons, this version of Godzilla gets a B. It would be a C, but the character design is insanely cool, and I do like the concept of the story, the concept of a Godzilla that is completely taken over Earth and driven so much fear into the hearts of humanity that they realized Earth wasn't worth it. And 20,000 years later, Godzilla has reshaped the Earth in his image. And I think that is a cool concept and just enough to elevate it to a B tier for me. And now finally, the most recent entry in the Godzilla IP to date, Godzilla Minus One. Now, I have not seen this movie yet, and I don't want to spoil the story for myself or any of you watching who haven't seen it yet. So for my ranking, I'm going to be going based on the information from the trailers and other publicly known information. So don't worry, no spoilers ahead. First of all, the design is fantastic. It is both an homage to the original Godzilla, but is still a fresh take on the character. And again, like the legendary version, the roar sounds like a modern update of the original Godzilla roar. Ah! 
and the story seems very interesting. It takes place in 1945 following the ending of World War II. It sounds like Godzilla has attacked once before and Japan was powerless to stop him, and now he is back. Both the time period that it's set in and the detail of the two different attacks could possibly mean that they are taking Godzilla back to his roots as a metaphor for the atomic bombs. Not only does this sound interesting, but in its time in theaters, it has also garnered a massive positive response. It feels dramatically different from the still running legendary Godzilla. And this feels very intentional on the part of the director Takashi Yamazaki. There's a quote from the director that I really think sums up the difference between these two running versions of Godzilla. And that is, the point of international Godzilla is that he's a really powerful monster, but a Japanese Godzilla is halfway a godlike creature in many ways. Not necessarily a religious god, but more like a Japanese god, a malevolent and destructive one. This is a great way to put it. Godzilla is a modern realization of Japanese mythology. That combined with modern fears of nuclear destruction. Neither Godzilla is right or wrong in their approach. They are both fantastic Godzillas, but taking two completely separate approaches. Based on everything that I've seen and heard so far, Godzilla Minus One gets an A tier, with the possibility of moving either upwards to an S or downward to a B after I've seen the movie. But so far though, I am definitely impressed. And with that, we have explained every version of Godzilla from its creation to present and ranked them all in my Godzilla tier list. I love the character of Godzilla, both where he started and how far he has come. There have been movies that stand out in his catalog as being truly incredible. The message is very well communicated and the design is both an homage to the original Godzilla but also unique in its own way. And there have also been times where I thought that the franchise lost its way for a time. Audiences really loved Godzilla and so the philosophy for a long time was to just pump out more and more Godzilla movies every year. They became more and more ridiculous and to me, they lost sight of Godzilla's original purpose. And this is not to say that the bad movies that I've rated badly didn't have good moments. In Godzilla communities online, I will see them remembering or reminiscing on several very heartfelt, very serious, or very touching moments from films that I have largely been very dismissive of in this video. And again, I want to reiterate, this is a subjective list. These are all my opinions, and you can absolutely have your own opinion. I would actually love to hear your own rankings and your own thoughts in the comments below. Just please be respectful. I'm a, I'm a gentle soul, please. In my opinion, what makes Godzilla great, and what has allowed him to last as long as he has, is that he has been used as a vehicle to express our cultural fears. Whether it is nuclear war, natural disaster, or threats to the environment, we have used Godzilla to express the horrors that we feel we are powerless to stop. It is a reminder that no matter how powerful the human race perceives itself to be, all it takes is one event for us to truly realize how small we are. And so with all that said, I hope that you enjoyed and I hope that you're not seething with anger at me for my rankings. If you are, leave a nice comment down below. <laughs> If you're grinding your teeth in rage right now, leave a compliment about me in the comments below. <laughs> we'll see how many more tier lists I do in the future. I find they can be very divisive because it's all opinion based and everyone's got their own opinions and some people have very strong opinions. <laughs> but feel free to leave a comment below in defense of your favorite Godzilla movie. Maybe I ranked it lower but there's something that I missed. And I'd love to hear your debates in the comments below as long as they are civil. And also thank you for the love on the last few videos. I've gotten several new subscribers as well as many really positive comments from you all and it means the world so thank you so much. And of course a huge thank you goes out to the patrons. Uh, 
I have a new camera set up, so I don't know where I'm putting the patrons, but you all are great. Uh, Sean and my top tier patrons, RD and Snowy, thank you so much for supporting me for this long, supporting the content, and supporting my dream of doing this as my job for you all. So with all that said, a very Merry Christmas and a Happy Holidays to you all, and I will see you next week for another video. I hope that you're excited for that because I know that I am. And cut.